let's get started. Welcome everyone to the 2021-2022 application updates webinar for our full-time MBA application. Um, we're really thrilled to have you join us here today for what we all hope will be a extremely informative session. Here's a bit about what we're going to cover uh, this evening. So exciting update uh, that our application is in fact open for our full-time MBA, both August entry and January entry. It's launched this week. Um, so really perfect timing and I'm excited to walk you through some of the details um, and changes uh, for this year. So I, we're gonna do quick introductions and really I'm going to be doing the introductions. Uh, I'm Jordan Blitzer. I'm an Associate Director of Admissions at CBS. I've been with the school for just about four years now. Um, so seen many application cycles at this point. Um, I'm joined sort of behind the scenes by two of my colleagues, uh, Morgan Janella, who uh, will pop on a little bit later to talk through some of the uh, application details as well. Um, and then Kate Holden, who is going to be uh, monitoring that live Q&A box. So I'm going to walk through general updates, talk about what's new this year, um, and then we will get into some live Q&A as well. I see that some questions are already coming in. Um, we really appreciate that. We do encourage you to really listen to the presentation, um, give us a chance to share some of the content with you. Uh, we did take a look at several of the questions that came through um, uh, you know, ahead of the event uh, and really tried to incorporate some of the answers to those questions in the presentation. We will be utilizing upvoting, which is a feature many of you are probably familiar with at this point, given we've all been on Zoom for quite some time. Um, but basically, that gives you the opportunity to see what your fellow viewers um, are asking and then like that to have it uh, upvoted and answered um, sooner in the Q&A. We are going to try to get to as many of those questions as possible. Um, but you know, we're only three of us, so we'll, we'll do our best. There are a lot more of you than there are of us. So um, before we dive into the application, I thought it would be fruitful for me to walk through some of the new updates um, and initiatives that are coming out of CBS. Uh, again, integrating some of the questions you all submitted ahead of time um, to sort of inform this slide. So many of you wanted to know what we were doing in terms of our campus being open. Um, and we've seen a pretty amazing, uh, you know, community coming together in the last year and a half, as so many communities have um, in terms of managing the pandemic. Um, we've been operating under uh, a high flex model, which is a, essentially a combination of both in-person learning for those who are able to, of course, adhering to, to all of those state and local requirements, um, and then virtual uh, programming, both academic and extracurricular. So we're really excited to announce that we are reopening campus um, for our students uh, in the fall. Uh, we can't wait to have them back. Virtually all of our students are going to be able to be back, which we're really happy about. It definitely doesn't feel the same around here without our students walking the halls. Um, but what that unfortunately means is we're not quite open to visitors yet. So I know that was something that was on a lot of your minds. We are going to do everything that we can to keep our current students safe um, and manage the pandemic accordingly uh, this fall. And I hope that in future semesters, maybe this spring, uh, we'll be able to welcome many of you to campus and to our buildings. Speaking of the spring, we are going to be moving to two new buildings uh, in Manhattanville. So we're moving towards Manhattanville uh, this December and then officially opening those two new buildings right now for our students, faculty and staff uh, in January of 2022. This has been sort of a long time coming. Um, so we're excited to finally be making that move. And while we will be missing Uris Hall, which is the building that we've been in for pretty much the entirety of the CBS existence, um, we think that it will be a really amazing enhanced experience for our students to be in these two new state-of-the-art buildings. So 
moving towards that. It's one additional subway stop on the one train line for those of you who are familiar with New York City, um, which is the subway that runs along the west side of Manhattan. So uh, definitely still very easily accessible um, and very much looking forward to that in case that wasn't already clear. Um, so finally, I wanted to cover um, a new initiative called the Phillips Pathway for Inclusive Leadership, which I will speak a little bit more about as we talk through some of our essay questions. You may have already reviewed our new essay questions, um, and we do you know, talk about PPIL, as we call it, Phillips Pathway for Inclusive Leadership, um, in that essay. But just to give you a big picture overview on what PPIL is, um, it is a co-curricular program that was designed by two former students in collaboration with the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Initiative. Um, and it's really aimed at equipping our students with essential skills for managing diversity. Um, and that's through a combination of assessments, workshops, and it's an ongoing journey throughout your time as a CBS student. So it starts, you know, at the very beginning of your time as a first year and you continue to you know, have experiences so through this co-curricular model um, throughout your two years uh, at CBS. So again, we'll talk a little bit more and PPIL will come up uh, again in some future slides. So um, before we dive in, I mentioned at, at the beginning of this that um, we really are going to be focusing on talking about the full-time MBA, but I would be remiss if I didn't note that we do have a couple of different ways to obtain an MBA at Columbia, and regardless of which sort of method you choose, you are receiving the one Columbia MBA. So we have our deferred enrollment program. Um, which is designed for college seniors. Maybe some of you are getting ahead of the game and uh, want to apply as college seniors. Um, that application is not yet open. Uh, so that will open in mid-November. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, and then we also have our executive MBA. Maybe some of you on the line are considering, you know, should I do a full-time MBA? Should I do an executive MBA? That is a separate application process, of course. Um, and that is designed for folks who have a bit more work experience um, than the, the full-time MBA program. Again, since this focus is the full-time MBA for this webinar, I'm gonna dive a little deeper into the options that are available at CBS for the full-time MBA. Um, there are two, as you can see from this slide. Uh, the first being the, the traditional two-year MBA, what a lot of people think of when they think of an MBA program. Um, it is our August entry. So as you can see here on the slide, first semester, you start in the fall with the core, you continue in the spring with core and electives, and then you break for the summer for 10 to 12 week summer internship and return in the fall of your second year to take electives for the fall and the spring. We have another option uh, for January entry, which is 16 consecutive months. Um, where you actually start your studies in the spring with uh, the core, and then throughout the summer are taking core and elective classes and resume electives in the fall of your second year, along with those who started in August. The key distinction here is that summer internship. Um, those who seek out doing January entry typically are those who do not need a summer internship to get to that next stage in their uh, professional path. They may be sponsored students. They may be students who are gonna go to a family business, uh, potentially entrepreneurs or folks who just have a robust network in the industry that they're looking to go into or that they were already in and really just need some of the um, academic tools uh, or the theories and, and, and experiences of business school to be able to make that shift. Um, regardless of whether you start in August or January, you graduate as one MBA class in the spring of your second year. Um, and just for context, there's about 750 people in each class. So about 500-ish um, for August entry, and then about 250 for, for January. So again, graduating class of 750. So let's dive into a little bit about the application. Um, what has not changed about the application is that it is still a holistic process. What we're asking you to do may be a little different than years past, but what we're looking for hasn't changed. So we're still focusing on these three key pillars, 
and I'll talk through each of them, but it is holistic and not one of these three is more important than the other. Um, so starting at the top, just because it's easy, um, is academic strength. So we are going to ask you to report to us your undergraduate record, how you did and what you chose to study in undergrad. Um, if you have already also obtained a master's degree, we are going to ask you to also submit information on that, but we're really focusing on that undergraduate record. We are also going to ask you to take either the GMAT, the GRE, or the executive assessment. Um, we are asking that you submit your application with your personal best score. So um, you, know, you should only submit an application once you have actually achieved the score that you're looking to achieve that you feel is your personal best. Um, and you only need to take one of the three. You do not need to take all three. That is a question sometimes we get from this slide, um, but please only take one um, of these options. Two, professional promise. So we are asking for a professional resume. As a rule of thumb, um, for full-time MBA applicants, we typically encourage one page, if possible, where possible. Um, we are now only asking for one recommendation, one letter of recommendation for both um, first-time applicants and re-applicants. So please keep that in mind. That is a bit of a shift from, from previous years. We are now only asking for one uh, letter of recommendation. Or we want to know what you want to do post MBA that we ask you to sort of give us in a short blurb, um, almost like a tweet, uh, where you then get to elaborate on in essay one. I'm going to talk about essays more in depth on the next slide, so I don't want to get too far into it now, but just know that essay one is really around your professional promise and what you want to do in the future, short term and long term. You'll see interview is listed twice. This is because interviews are both you know, professional in nature and really a way for um, our alums or our committee to get to know you personally. So uh, interviews typically are conducted by a local alum. Um, of course, everything has been virtual, but you know, in non-pandemic times, they would be uh, in person with a local alum. Um, they are by invitation only. And I know that we'll talk a little bit more about the application timeline uh, as we get into this this presentation, but uh, just know that the interviewer that you are uh, connecting with only has your resume and what you share with them. They do not have access to your application. So that is also why it's sort of under both buckets is it's professional in nature, but also uh, somewhat behavioral. So finally, personal characteristics. My favorite part of reading applications, if I'm being honest, um, is, you know, really, who are you? Um, what extracurricular activities do you participate in when you have free time? What are your hobbies and activities that you like to, to do? Um, they could be associated with work. They can be completely separate. Um, we also are going to ask you how you spent your time extracurricularly in college, uh, in undergrad. So definitely prepared to talk about that as well. Um, in terms of essays, again, we're gonna talk about this on the next slide, so I won't jump ahead too much, but uh, the two of the three that you will need to answer um, in terms of your second and third essays really are to get to know you better um, and, and to get to know you beyond just your uh, professional experience and professional future goals, um, but really to, just to, to dive into to who you are as a person, um, getting to know you in a more meaningful way. So with that, let's talk about the essays. There are a lot, there's a lot of information here. And so I'm sure there will be some questions on this, but I hope that um, this will be a little clearer um, for, for, for you all uh, moving into preparing for these, for these essays. So key takeaway number one, essay one is required. Um, through your resume and recommendation, we have a clear sense of your professional path to date. What do you wanna do? What do you wanna do in the next three to five years? What do you want to do in the long term in, in, in your dream job? That is a must do. Every applicant must do. You have to choose two of three of the, the what's in the dark blue box. So um, I'm going to walk through you know, those three options, um, but just want to be perfectly clear that essay one is required. And then you get the option to choose two or three of the following. So first one. Um, I spoke about PPIL earlier. Um, 
this question really asks you to tell us about a time that you were challenged around one of the five skills that are highlighted in bold in white. So creating an inclusive environment, mitigating bias, communicating across identities, addressing systemic and systemic inequity, excuse me, and managing difficult conversations. A tip here, don't try to focus on all five of the skills. Focus on the one. That's what we ask you to do. Um, essentially, in the prompt, in that last sentence, describe the situation and actions you took and the outcome. We're giving you a guidebook on, on, on how to answer this question. That's what we're looking to, to learn. Um, there's no embedded question beyond the question here. Um, I like when I speak to applicants, I like to say that we really are not trying to trick you on any of these questions. We really just want you to answer the prompt. So focus on that. We give you a guidebook. Don't overthink it. Um, an example of, you know, an answer that might be something you would want to consider. Again, not trying to put any ideas into anyone's head. But um, you know, for creating an inclusive environment, maybe you were in uh, on a team where there was a team member who constantly was speaking over others and you know was really interrupting, and you intervened to make sure that your other teammates were heard um, and other colleagues were were heard from. Um, what was the outcome of that? Hopefully, illustrating that a little bit can help if you're interested in answering this question. Moving on to question number two, um, why do you feel Columbia Business School is a good fit for you? This essay is a really great place for you to illustrate why you're interested in CBS um, and what about our community specifically is exciting to you and how you see yourself fitting into it. Um, what is Columbia Business School going to equip you with to be successful in the future? Um, and then finally, tell us about a favorite book, movie or song and why it resonates with you. I. These are all amazing questions. Um, all three options are great. We wouldn't have given you the option to choose two of the three if we as a committee weren't comfortable with that. So please pick the ones that you feel make the most sense for you and your story. Um, again, two of the three, you do not need to answer four essay questions. It's essay one and then two of the three in the dark blue box. And we really do not have a preference. Answer them authentically. And, and honestly for, for your story. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Morgan Janella, who's going to talk through the timeline. Thank you, Jordan. It'll be good to give Jordan's voice a little break. Um, I hope all of our attendees really um, found it useful, the detail Jordan went into talking about various entry points at CBS, the application requirements. Uh, my name is Morgan, as Jordan mentioned earlier, member of the admissions team here at CBS. And I'm gonna take the next few minutes to talk in depth about the application deadlines and the timeline for our review process at Columbia Business School. Because I think the first thing I wanna say is Columbia Business School uses rolling admissions. So this is different than most of our peer schools that utilize rounds. Yes, a lot of our deadlines are similar to round one, round two, round three deadlines, but it's important to remember that Columbia Business School utilizes rolling admissions. So that means we're reviewing applications and rendering decisions as we go. So it is to your advantage to apply earlier in the cycle. I always say though, you need to apply at the time that is right for you. And all of you are taking the first step by being here tonight. There is plenty of time for a early decision application, a January 2022 application. So I don't want to add stress and push all of you to think you need to apply next week. No, you need to apply at the time that is right for you, but keep in mind these deadlines and just remember that we do utilize rolling admissions. So looking closely at the deadlines on our slide, for those of you that are interested in starting in January, 2022, your application must be received by October 6. Um, as Jordan noted, the application went live two days ago. I know I've seen a couple applications come in already, um, but for those of you interested in January 2022 entry, your application has to come in no later than October 6. For those of you interested in August entry, so August 2022 entry, more than a year away still, but it will be here before we know it, we have two options for 
August 2022 entry. You can apply early decision or you can apply regular decision. Early decision is the binding commitment that if you are admitted to CVS, you will be required to pay your $6,000 tuition deposit within two weeks of admission, and you sign the honor code that you will withdraw your applications and or admissions from other schools. So early decision is a great fit for people that know CVS is their first choice, 150% want to come to CVS if admitted. So if applying early decision is right for you, that application needs to be received by October 6th as well. If you decide that you want to apply to a handful of business schools and, and figure out in the spring where you would like to enroll, then you will apply regular decision. If you are applying regular decision, there are also two deadlines to keep in mind. If you would like to be considered, um, give, be given priority consideration for merit fellowships, merit fellowships are awarded by the admissions committee based on the merits of your application, that application has to come in by January 5th. You do not need to wait. For example, you don't need to wait till October 6th, January 5th, or April 8th to click submit. These are just the last dates in rolling admissions they need to be received. And then lastly, for regular decision, we will accept applications through April 8th. Um, we will receive the large majority of our applications by January 5th. However, we know anything we've learned in the past year and a half is, we know things happen. We know the world changes. Um, so circumstances change. So yes, people apply in February. People apply in March. People apply on April 8th. They, people are admitted if they apply on April 8th, but that is getting later on in the cycle. So again, for those of you that are here tonight um, doing your research nice and early, I would encourage you to apply earlier in the cycle where possible. So that is, I hope that kind of explains some of our deadlines. I want to dig a little bit deeper into the timeline for each application. So for all applications, it is our goal to invite or do not to invite you to interview or not proceed with you in the process. So that would be a deny within six weeks of your application being received and complete. There's a little bit of a caveat right now is so if you applied regular decision right now, we typically pause to review our regular decision applications until we've read all of our January applications and August early decision applications. So I should have phrased it a little bit differently at the get-go, but if you apply tomorrow, if you apply next month, if you've applying, if you are applying for January 2022 entry or August early decision entry, once your application is complete, meaning we have that recommendation letter that has to come in within um, that should ideally come in very close to when you submit your application, but it has to come in within two weeks of submitting your application. Once your application is complete, it will go under review. And then within six weeks, we will let you know whether or not you've been invited to interview. If you applied regular decision next week, and you can, you can submit a regular decision application right now, your application will hang out in what I call the electronic waiting room. Typically in late November, we start reviewing regular decision applications, um, and that's when your six-week clock would start. We would email you to notify you when your six-week clock started. Um, and for all of these rounds, we're reviewing applications with all of these different deadlines and, and options. We are reviewing applications in the order in which they were received. If invited to interview, you will be sent the name of an alum in your local area um, and asked to arrange a virtual interview. So through the end of this year, through the end of December 2021 at least, we will be requiring interviews to remain virtual. Um, there's still just so much going on in the world um, that we will be requiring interviews to remain virtual for the remainder of 2021. So if invited to interview, you get the name of an alum in your local area. We ask that you set up a Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, a video conferencing tool, and the interview should be conducted in English. Um, the alum will then submit an interview report back to the admissions team. Once the admissions committee receives that interview report, within two weeks, we will give you a final decision. So again, that is the process for your deadlines and the timeline for your interview invitation. Um, you know, it's a lot of information to kind of go through, um, 
Jordan, Kate, and I have been doing this for many years, so it all makes sense in our head, um, but happy to clarify any additional questions um, once we move to the Q&A portion. Thanks so much, Morgan. Um, so with that, we're going to kind of get into the question answer session. Um, I'm going to stop my screen share so you can see all of us, but Kate is here with us um, and is going to sort of start to feed us some questions. So Kate, what's on everyone's mind? Yes, lots of questions coming into the Q&A. So thank you everybody for submitting um, the mostly upvoted questions so far, and I have seen it trickle in a couple of times is regarding recommendations. Um, can people submit more than one recommendation if they would like to? So sadly, the answer is no. Um, we are sticking to our one recommendation requirement. Um, the caveat to that would be if you have someone who you wanted to write in on your behalf who's affiliated with the Columbia Business School community, um, they can submit. It doesn't have to be a full recommendation to us, but it can be sort of a letter of support to the admissions team, and we would be happy to add that to your file. Um, but otherwise, we're really asking that people stick to the one recommendation. Great. Thank you so much. Um, next question with a lot of votes is regarding how to best prepare for the admissions interview, um, what types of questions to expect, and if there are any tips you have for being prepared for the interview. Maybe we both want to take some of this, Morgan. Um, if you want to start, I'm happy to chime in with my few sure. cents. So the interview is a, think of it as a positive step in the process. The admissions committee has seen parts of your application or we've seen all of your application but there's part of your application that we want to know more we want to get to know you better so the interview with the alum think of it as a conversation um you should treat it though you know i always the default to say go into it treating it as a formal job interview dress you know dress professionally um provide your resume in advance um, and follow the alums lead you know, some stay more formal, some stay more casual, but at the end of the day, we're encouraging the alumni to have a conversation with you to discuss your interest in CBS and your career goals. Um, think of it as a two-way street. You should also be asking the alumni about their experiences at CBS. Um, I also think back to what Jordan said in the presentation that we encourage you to be genuine and authentic in your application because that genuineness and authenticity also needs to carry over into your interview. It's, it's hard to tell a different story in an interview that's not your, your true passions and your true goals. So, you know, if you're telling us in your essays that you want to go into healthcare consulting, and then you're telling the interview that you want to go into private equity, the admissions committee is going to look at your application and the interview report and say, what's going on here? You know, what does this person really want to do, you know, career-wise? if you follow Jordan's advice and remain genuine and authentic and really have a good sense of your goals and what you want to get out of an MBA experience, that will tend to shine through in your interview as well. Yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there, Morgan. Um, there's not a ton more I think I would add. Um, I think don't overthink it, which is something that I said um, in the essay portion, but again, you know your story better than anyone. So uh, definitely that should be able to, to be pretty clear in the interview. A lot of applicants who then matriculate as students who we work with um, say that the interview process is really pleasant and that they really enjoyed getting an opportunity to talk to an alum um, who very much might not have the same interests or professional experience that they do, but it still is a really uh, pleasant and exciting and fun conversation. So have fun with it. Great, thank you so much. Um, again, either, either one of you can take the question regarding standardized tests. We have a ton coming in. So I'll start with the first one, which is if you decide to take the GRE, do we require the writing section? Yes, we do require the writing section, but we know that that test, we know that the writing score might not pop up right away. Um, so again, I do encourage you all to take your standardized test. Um, 
with plenty of time before the, the date in which you plan to submit for CBS. But yes, you could submit your GRE score. You could submit the application with your GRE score kind of without that writing score, but you would need to give that to us once you receive it. Um, it would be my advice to take the GRE in plenty of time such that you can give us your full score report when you submit your application. Excellent. And then just to follow up with another standardized test question, um, many people interested just to get some guidance around EA scores, um, given that our class profile only highlights GMAT. Can you give some direction on what we're looking for or averages um, when we're reviewing applications that include executive assessment scores? Yeah, so for the executive assessment, we executive assessment, the, I call it the EA, it's easier to say than a mouthful. Um, for the EA, it's still very early um, in the number of years we've been taking it for the full-time MBA program, so we don't have specific stats to share just yet. Great, thank you. Um, a couple of questions just about moving to Manhattanville and if there will be any changes to how we plan to foster our culture and our community, given that we will be on a new campus. Yeah, so I can take a stab at this one. I think um, only time will tell, but as I mentioned when I was sort of exuding my excitement, which was hopefully palpable over the Zoom webinar, um, I think that just being in a new, fresh, open space um, where there is a, a very much open space for people to congregate um, and collaborate, I think that that will really do wonders for a community that already has pretty has fostered a pretty tight knit um, experience for our students. Um, I think stay tuned um, or apply and hopefully you, you will be a part of that with us um, on that journey. Perfect, thank you. Um, a couple of questions coming through from candidates who are reapplying this year. Um, do you have any tips for reapplicants and can you give some examples of how you've seen reapplicants improve their candidacy? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, Quick plug is that we actually will be doing a webinar specifically for reapplicants um, in August. So if you are not already signed up for that, please do register um, on our website the same way you registered for this event, because we will do a much deeper dive into sort of how you can enhance your, your application. Um, I think the key difference with reapplicants is that you actually are not required if you applied in the last cycle uh, to submit three new essays. You will only need to submit one new essay, um, which would be tell us about the ways in which your application has you know, changed over the course of the time since you applied last to when you're applying now. So a question I often get um, for folks is, you know, I applied sort of later in the cycle, this cycle, I wanna do an early decision application, which is already open. Not a lot has changed in the past two months. Um, Morgan mentioned this, all of you who are tuning into this are clearly very advanced and prepared and are getting a head start on this process. So you can give it a little bit more time. You can give it some more time to see if at work you take on some new projects. Um, you can give it a bit more time to maybe try it taking a stab at um, that GRE or EA or GMAT again. Um, if there hasn't been something that very clearly has changed because there hasn't been a, a large amount of time since you last submitted, maybe give it a little space would be a recommendation that, that I have on that. But we are going to talk a lot more about the reapplication process on that webinar um, in August. So stay tuned and tune in. Great, thank you. Um, couple of questions coming in about certifications. If people have a CFA or a CPA, how is that weighed um, when we are reviewing application? So we definitely want to know. Um, we want to know that you, you accomplished those certifications or, um, but you know, it's part of the holistic review process. It, it, people who have them are not looked on upon more favorably for the, from those who do not. Um, but definitely tell us because it's good for us to know both in the um, extracurricular section um, as well as on your resume. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, just a quick, quick thing that we should maybe brush on is the consortium, uh, given that we have joined the consortium. A um, couple of questions just asking how that application differs from this and if the deadlines are the same or um, just a little bit of guidance if they're planning to apply that route. Great. Happy to start with this one, Jordan, and I'll let you chime in. So we are excited that we joined the consortium. Um, I think our membership officially begins tomorrow, July 1. Um, so if you will be applying to CBS via the consortium, you will need to follow the consortium's, the consortium's application deadlines. And also, so everyone knows, we will have more details about the consortium and our, and our membership in it on our website. Um, that will be coming, end of, I'm gonna say next week, um, since our membership officially starts tomorrow. But for example, I believe the consortium's um, first early action deadline is October 15th. So what would happen is you as the applicant would apply via the consortium to CBS. You would submit the consortium's application and there will also be a CBS supplemental application as part of your consortium package. The consortium will then give CBS after October 15th, all of the application materials. You would then be, your application would then be reviewed, reviewed by the admissions committee at CBS. You would then potentially be invited to interview, um, most likely with an alum in your local area. Um, and then it, just like with our other applicants, it would come back to the committee for a full review. Um, and then we would typically render a decision in, um, I would think approximately December for those applicants that applied via the consortium by the October 15th deadline. And then I believe the other deadline for the consortium is January 5th. So it would just be a, a different timeline in the spring. Um, but I would definitely encourage you to visit the consortium's website and also stay tuned for our website when more details go live. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, next question is regarding merit-based fellowships. Um, are they available? Is there a difference between eligibility should people decide to apply early decision versus regular decision? I can start with this one, Morgan, and then of course, feel free to chime in. So um, as Morgan mentioned, in order to be considered for the Merit Fellowship priority consideration, you must apply by that January 5th deadline. Um, if you apply early decision, obviously you fall, you would have applied by in October, so you would fall within that window. Um, so the thing you need to do is put together the strongest application possible for you. Um, it, the, the merit fellowship considerations are based on the merits of your application. Um, and so there's no additional action required to be considered for merit-based fellowships other than um, submitting by that deadline. Um, anything you wanna add on that, Morgan, or? No, cool, okay, I think we covered it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, regarding the wait list, if someone was to be waitlist, could you talk a little bit about the process and how we stay in touch and inform people of any updates to their candidacy? Well, I would certainly encourage everyone to think positively. Let's not think waitlist just yet. Um, but, you know, to be transparent, yes, we will either admit students, um, place students on the waitlist, or not offer admission to CBS. If you are placed on the waitlist, you will most likely be assigned um, a waitlist manager who would communicate with you throughout your waitlist process. Um, the waitlist is not necessarily ranked. Um, remember, we're looking to build a class in the most diverse sense, all different industries from all over the world. So we are really looking to um, just to bring in classmates from all over the world to make your clusters and make your learning team. So I would say if you are placed on the waitlist, um, you will just follow the advice and instructions from your waitlist manager. And I would just add, there's a oh. Again, thinking positive, we're, not, we're, we're, we're going to all, all good things come out of your application, um, but the wait list is not a bad thing, right? As Morgan mentioned, as um, you know, when you get to the interview stage, that means that there's a lot that the committee is interested in learning more about. Being placed on the wait list means that there's a lot that the committee is excited about in your application. So um, don't be discouraged. Thank you both for your insight there. Um, questions about updated test scores. Um, can people submit updated test scores after they submit their application? 
Um, no, as Jordan mentioned earlier in the, in the presentation, we um, ask that you submit your application when you have the test score that you feel is your personal best and are ready to click submit. Hey, that's one of the benefits of rolling admissions, perhaps. Um, you know, we, yes, we do give you, a, you know, kind of an, an end by deadline, but there is a lot of flexibility um, on the actual date you choose to apply. Great, thank you. Um, are interviews typically conducted by a member of our team and the admissions committee or alumni? Yeah, so 95% of the time I'll say um, it's conducted by an alum. Uh, the interviews are alums specifically as Morgan mentioned through December, 2021, we are going to be requiring that those interviews are conducted virtually with an alum um, and the applicant. Uh, but in non-pandemic times, they actually would be in person with an alum in your local area. That 5% of the time um, where you're interviewing with an admissions committee member is usually because you're in a remote location or don't um, have the ability to actually meet face-to-face uh, -face with an alum. Um, but again, that's pretty rare. By and large, it's, it's with an alum. Great. Thank you. Um, more of like a gen general question about our program um, for people who have backgrounds that may not be the traditional finance or consulting. Um, to what extent does our program work for them and are we open to non-traditional candidates? What other paths do we have students coming from and going into at CBS? Yeah, so I can start. I think we have a lot to say on this topic. So I think the first thing I'll say is you should look at our class profile um, on our website. And I'm saying that only to because it illustrates a pretty great picture of like where people are actually coming from. About 25% of our um, students are coming from a finance background, 25% are coming from consulting, but the other 50% um, are coming from all other industries. We've had uh, former Rockettes in the class, former athletes in the class, um, folks who come from teaching backgrounds, uh, many folks who come from you know teach for america or um, people who are coming from the arts um, i can go kind of on and on with the the breadth of uh, experiences that our students have um, and that doesn't just apply to uh, previous work experience but also academic backgrounds we have people who studied sociology or anthropology or history or um, english or literature in the class and are very successful in the classroom um, i think you know, the core curriculum is really designed to help set people up for success and give them those business fundamental tools um, for the future, for when they are in the, the business world, whatever that means, right? It might not mean going to work at a consulting firm or in an investment bank. Um, it might be starting your own endeavor or working at a nonprofit. So um, there are extensive resources for students who, even if they do come from the quote unquote traditional backgrounds, um, who feel they need to brush up on some of those skills, those more quantitative skills, because they didn't study them in undergrad and or the people who have no background in them whatsoever. Um, those resources are available to actually our admitted students before they matriculate. Right around now, we're giving access to the folks who are gonna get started in August. Um, maybe a couple of weeks ago, we started uh, giving them access to those resources, but really to prepare um, and to feel set up for success once you know, class starts in mid-August. Morgan, anything you want to add there? No, I think that's great. I'm also trying to help, um, I'm trying to help Kate with a bit of the, uh, oh. the questions that are coming in the Q&A box to typing some answers. Um, okay. But no, I think that was a great response. Perfect. Thank you, Morgan. <laughs> yes. Again, if we don't get to all of your questions, as always, please feel free to reach out and we'd be happy to answer any specific questions you have that we don't get to, but um, we do still have some time. So I will tee up another one for you regarding recommendations. So I know we um, already mentioned that it's one recommendation for this cycle. Um, can you shed a little light on what we're looking for within a recommendation? If for example, somebody works for a family business and they don't necessarily have a supervisor, What's an example of somebody we would accept a recommend, uh, recommendation letter from? Um, do they have specific questions to answer? Um, just a little more of a deep dive on the recommendation letter. Sure, 
happy to speak more to the recommendation requirement. So on our website, you will see the two prompts that we ask your recommender to consider. Um, this is, these are fairly similar prompts to our peer schools. Um, we hoped we could make the process a bit easier for your recommender. So you're not asking your recommender to write 10 different letters. Um, you know, they can certainly, they certainly can edit it for each school and provide CBS specifics if they like, but I would encourage you to look at those two prompts on our website. Um, you know, we're looking for the recommender, you know, who should ideally be your current direct supervisor, somebody they can speak to your professional achievements, how you work on a team, um, how do you project manage, and how do you collab collaborate with others. Um, so it's somebody that knows you well, somebody that works with you on a daily basis. We don't need the CEO of the company to write the letter. We want your direct manager to write the letter. If you can't get a recommendation from your direct manager, maybe it would impact a potential bonus if you're not telling folks you're applying to business school, that's okay. We would ask that you just tell us in the application why we are not getting a recommendation letter from your current direct supervisor. Um, maybe you can ask a former supervisor, um, perhaps a senior colleague, those are good options. And then to Kate's question too, what if you work for a family business, right? We don't want a recommendation from mom or dad or aunt or uncle, um, but maybe there is a board member who's not a family member. Maybe there's a client uh, that you work with or a distributor. Um, and also if you, it's kind of similar if you work for yourself, if you're an entrepreneur, um, again, you could look to a client, an advisor, a board member. Um, so the, hopefully those give you some options for who should write your recommendation letter. And Jordan, please chime in if I missed anything. No, I think you got it. I think um, if you have more specific questions, because sometimes these can get kind of nitty gritty, uh, definitely reach out to us. Um, we'll be sharing the, the email address for our full team. So um, we're happy to talk more one-on-one -on -one about this type of thing as well. Great. Thank you so much. Um, questions about extracurricular activities. Um, what's the best way to showcase them within the application? And when you're typing it into the field, do they need to include a short description or what are we looking for when it comes to extracurriculars? Definitely. Um, I can take a stab at this one. So there is a section on our application where you can um, input specific, I think the, the maximum amount you can put is three different extracurriculars. Um, maybe you only have one and that's great. Maybe you have five. And that's also great, but you aren't going to be able to input all five. You will have to prioritize which of the three you want to input in your application. That being said, again, going back to the, the presentation, it is a holistic review process. So the readers of your application will not only be reading the application itself, but also the materials that you upload with it. So that includes a resume. Perhaps the two of the five that you didn't get to put in the application are listed somewhere on your resume. Don't just let it fall off because the application doesn't allow you to submit more than three. Um, definitely tell us how you spend your time. Again, that's so important to us to get a sense of how you would contribute to our community. And the only way we know that is if you tell us. Another place where you could, in theory, add some of this content, and we haven't really talked about the optional essay yet, uh, hasn't come up, um, but there is an optional essay section um, and we all like to say it really does not have to be an essay. If there's anything else that you want to share with the committee, uh, maybe it's something about your um, full-time work experience during college. Maybe you had a full-time job while you were doing undergrad, um, but there's no other place really on the application to, to, to share that. Tell us that in a sentence or two in the optional essay. Um, again, doesn't have to be an essay, can be bullet points but things like additional uh, extracurriculars, like you mentioned, or um, you know, just additional context for the, the readers, anything that you think is left out elsewhere um, is great to put in that, that essay for optional essay. Excellent, thank you. Um, kind of a more broad opinion question that I'd love to get both of your takes on. Um, in the essays, and I think even beyond the essays, just throughout the whole application, um, what do you look for when you're reading applications? Um, what qualities are most in line with the class that we're trying to bring in from an admissions perspective? Um, is there anything that you are always looking for when you're reviewing applications, certain backgrounds, experiences, qualities, um, and just, just some general advice? And I think we can probably wrap after that. 
Sure, that's a loaded lot of questions. Um, so, gosh, okay. When I'm reading, I think I mentioned this in the presentation. I love those essays that give us insights to into who you are. Um, the the essays two and three, whichever of the three you choose. Um, I think that I love reading and learning from those essays. Um, you know, about an obscure musical artist or a book that I'd never heard of, an author I'd never heard of. Um, I like to be able to envision the applicant on our campus um, and what they would do to contribute to make this place an even better place than it already is. Um, I also love the hobbies and activities section. It's one of my personal favorites because I think it just really humanizes people. Um, maybe you have a dog and you take your dog for a three mile walk every single day. Um, I want to know that about you. Um, maybe you have a infatuation with baking or cooking or whatever, you know, maybe you've picked up a new COVID hobby. Uh, that was definitely a fun thing to, to learn more about in this process was, you know, what people have started doing during the pandemic. Um, so be authentic, be true to you. There's no, no one right answer. Um, and I think those unique elements of each applicant really make for this amazing family of a class of 750 people where there really is something for everyone, um, which I think just makes it for such a unique and rich MBA experience. To, you know, to add to that, I think I'm always, I'm always drawn to how applicants are able to share their, their personal successes, you know, they're driven, you are driven, you know, you, all of you, you are driven, you are accomplished academically, professionally, but yet there's also a level of collaboration and a desire for your colleagues or your future classmates to succeed. At CBS, so much of the learning and professional development will be team-based, you know, so for all of you that are the consultants on this webinar, there will be many, many, many new classmates that want to go into strategy consulting. And you might have 10 things to do that day, but you're gonna do a case prep interview with them. You are gonna, you know, you are gonna help them ace that first interview. You know, I think that just speaks so much to the culture of CBS. You know, we have our career fellows that are second year students that apply to essentially help first year students get their dream job. We have peer advisors, which are second year students that come back from summer vacation, come back from winter vacation early to serve as your orientation leader. So yes, you are driven, you are accomplished, you are smart, you're successful, but you're not getting there without your classmates. You want them to achieve their goals as much as you do. And this, as Jordan said, this comes through in your essays, this comes through in your recommendation letter, this comes through in your interview. Um, I think, you know, We've all been on, you know, Kate, Jordan, and I have been on the admissions team for quite some time, and we really just enjoy getting to know you throughout the application process and really seeing who we're able to bring in in the next class. I think that was going to be our last question. So what I'm going to do now is I just dropped our um, email address, as promised, into the chat box. Um, if you didn't get your question answered, or if you have more questions that you, um, you know, that come up over the course of the next few days or weeks or months as you're preparing your application, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we are monitoring that inbox all day, every day, um, and we'll get back to you with the answer to your question as soon as we can. Um, I'm not going to pull up the closing slide, but want to thank you all so much um, for joining this evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. I want to thank our ASL team, uh, the interpreters who joined us today, um, Morgan and Kate for their time. Um, and we look forward to engaging with you again soon in, in this virtual environment and in the process. And best of luck. Take care. Bye-bye.